this Veterans Day yesterday. If you are a veteran here this morning, uh, we want to do something. We just want to pray over you. I want the congregation to now take a stand for you. If you're a veteran, you just go ahead and just be seated, you and your, your spouse, if you want, and the rest of the congregation, if you'll just stand. You see, they took a stand for us. They took a stand for us. Now we're going to take a stand for them. If you would, if you see if you see a veteran just sitting down, just raise your just look toward them and raise your hand over them and let's pray over them. Father God, I just thank you for our veterans. God, we have the freedom to worship today, this morning, because of the great sacrifice that these men and women have given for us. Oh Father, I thank you today for their precious families that have been with them through all the hard times, through the through the service that they've been through, maybe even seeing active duty in war. Oh, Father, the coming home, trying to make life work, and Lord, knowing that there are wounds, knowing that there are scars. Oh, Father, today we take a stand for them. Lord, we lift them up to you today. We just pray that you shower them with your blessings, God. I pray that you give them peace, spiritual peace, mental peace, Lord, emotional peace. Lord, they can live long, happy lives, God. And God, we are truly forever thankful for what they've done for us. And God, we thank you that you have given us veterans, given us men and women who have courage enough to lay their cares and their, their life aside to serve their great country. Lord, thank you for the blessings that you are bestowing upon us. And Lord, we pray today for every veteran in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Living sacrifices, cultivating characters. We go into to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 5, and it talks about being a living sacrifice for Christ. And we understand that begins in character. Now, character, we have to understand, uh, takes place, and there's a lot of, lot of things going on inside of us that God really wants to work in our lives to build up and to show out. 1912 was the maiden voyage of the Titanic. It was thought to be unsinkable. Three days into its voyage, April 14th, April 14th, the ship hit an iceberg and began to sink. It was decades later they finally recovered and found where the carcass of the ship lay. As they began to do more research into the Titanic and what happened to it, they discovered that it was made out of an inferior metal, that in the cold, icy waters of the North Atlantic became brittle. And when it hit the iceberg, that sharp, sharp, cut just like a sharp knife into the metal. What's unique about this is that iceberg hit it below the water line and cut a hole open. And water gushed in and it began to flood from one compartment to the next. Something that the creators, the, the inventors, the engineers never saw happening. They never thought that that many compartments could flood in a Titanic. It lost its buoyancy in a matter of three hours it sank. That ice that it hit, only one-tenth of that whole chunk of ice was above surface. The other nine-tenths were below the surface. So even all the six warnings that had been gone out that the Titanic crew failed to receive and investigate of icebergs being in the, in the area, even lookouts being on board looking across, did not see this small piece of ice on the surface, but yet this big ice underneath. They just sailed along at a high speed, higher than they should have in this area, and it cost them 1,500 lives. Through that, we can learn a lesson that a lot of things in life happen in your life below the surface things that you didn't see coming, things that maybe other people didn't see. And in your character begins to show out 
when those things happen. When something, a tragedy or trauma happens in your life, your character will show out what you really are made of, even though you didn't see it coming. When it happens, is your character made out of inferior materials that are kind of brittle and you're going to fall apart? Or is your character really based on the solid Word of God that you know that Christ is working in you and through you, no matter what comes your way, you're going to be all right. You're going to stay long. What is your character made out of? Are you really a living sacrifice for Christ? Are you living that way? So we look this morning in Romans chapter 12. Have your Bibles. If you'll turn with me, we'll read the first five verses. Cultivating Christian character. It was said your life as a Christian should make a non-believers question their disbelief in God. So our, our character, our life should be in, lived out in such a way that non-believers say, there's something different about you. I, I, don't, I can't put my finger on it, but there's something different about you. Where non-believers question why they do not believe in God. Just simply by reading the book that you present them, your life. They will examine the components that formulate strong Christian character and how that character reflects sacrificial living. So we begin reading chapter 12, verse 1 through 5. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Verse 3 says, For by grace given me, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all of the others. Let's pray together. Father God, today, as we look into this passage and begin to understand how uh, the nuts and bolts of our lives put together into our character so that we can truly be that living sacrifice that you want us to be, that you've called us to be. Sometimes, God, we make it so spiritual when it does take spiritual things. But God, sometimes it just takes practical mixed with the spiritual to reveal you living inside of us to others. And God, that we won't fall apart when life's unforeseen circumstances hit us. Help us today, God, to grow in knowledge and wisdom and grow in character. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are four basic components that compose a strong Christian character so that we may live as sacrifices to God. The first component of a Christian character is this, is that our identity is in Christ. Our identity is is in Christ. We see Christian, Christians establish and shape their character when they discover who they are in Christ Jesus. Who are you in Christ today? Is Jesus your foundation or is Jesus just a part-time thing that you kind of do on Sundays? Or, or is Jesus everything to you in your life? Do you have your life based on Him? Do, is the infrastructure of your life based on Christian principles and Christ's teaching, that he's really everything that you are, who are you in Christ? Verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable God, to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. See, when we answer this eternal question of Christ as Savior, we establish a foundation of security, of spirituality, emotional Immoral, moral, and psychologically, all founded in Christ. Our sense of security and well-being often determine 
the way we act, the way we think, the way we view others, the way we view our world, and ultimately the way we see ourselves. Simply our character based on our identity in Christ. Our Christ, Christ living inside of us, us having him as our foundation, having him as our infrastructure affects everything we do. How we see ourselves and the way that we see ourselves will receive others. Is Listen, if you do not love yourself, you won't love others very much either. It's not wrong to love yourself. Matter of fact, it's encouraged because that's the only way that we'll look at other people. If we do not like ourselves, we won't like others very much either. If we pick ourselves apart, we'll begin to pick others apart too. How we treat ourselves will be the way that we treat other people. Our character is anchored in a relationship with Christ and the passion that fires in our soul to be Christ-like. We cannot and will not consistently behave in a way that is inconsistent with the view that we have of ourselves in Christ. Character motivates consistency in our walk with Christ. What's going on on the inside? Listen, God is so much more interested in what's happening inside rather than outside. And we as Christians think what other people see about us is more important, and that's wrong. God is so much more interested in what's happening on the inside. Character motivates that consistency in our lives to walk with Jesus. Margaret Mead said it this way, what people say, what people do, and what people say they do are entirely different things. Verse 1, the latter part of it says, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Our Christian character should govern what we do both in private and in public. What happens in the privacy of your home and your life reflects who you really are. What a wake-up call. Because so often we're just worried about what people think about us. So we, we put our makeup on, we, we, we dress our clothes, we fix our hair a certain way. We, you know, we, we want our yard to look a certain way. We want our house to look a certain way. We want our vehicles to look a certain way. And some of us really don't care what our vehicles look like. Why? Because we want everybody to think well of us. We present things out there. And all along, the person that we really are is the one that's inside of our home with nobody else around. What goes on there? What are we watching? What are we listening to? What comes out of our mouth? What, what is going on in our life? That's who we really are. And listen, that can be an, uh, an ugly evaluation of who we are. Not based on what people say about us, but what's really going on. Identity in Christ. Our Christian character should govern what we do both in public and private. Our attitude and actions are to be honorable to God. This is our reasonable service. Our attitude does set our altitude. How high we truly do fly. In our attitude. See, our character will determine our attitude and our actions in good times and in bad times. Don't give in when adverse circumstances or feelings seem to invade your life. See, your circumstances may be beyond your control, but your character is not. See, founding your character in Christ is a choice. Listen, we can't always control what goes on around us, but we can control how we react to it. We can already have it programmed into our character, into our mind, the way that we're going to live, the way we're going to act, regardless of what comes our way. Will some things be shocking? Oh, yes, they will. Will some things hurt? Absolutely. So, Will we be knocked, uh, blindsided sometimes? Probably so. But where's your character? That's that firm foundation that you identify in Christ, that he is in charge, that he is in control. Regardless of what comes our way, we're going to be all right. We're going to make it through. We live out the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians tells us this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we talk about attitude, listen, 
we need to evaluate our life. Is my attitude really reflective of Christ? Am I being kind to people? Am I being gentle with people? Am I being patient with people, patient with myself? Do I have a loving outlook? Is there really joy going on in my life? You see, the difference between joy and happiness, happiness depends on the happenings outside. Joy depends on Christ living inside. Our attitude is reflective of our character, but our character should be indwelt by Christ. God wants full custody of us, not just weekend visits. I read that on the church sign. Sometimes we just get God the, the weekend visits. We'll show up for church. We'll hear a message. We'll sing a little bit. We'll read the bulletin. We'll play on our phone. Brother Kevin shuts up. We go home. God wants us full time. Second component we see is not only is our identify, identity in Christ, and that's where our character is founded is in him. The second component of a Christian character is self-discipline. Self-discipline. Self-discipline is a motivator and ability to do what is right when no one is watching and, we don't, and you don't feel like doing it. There are some things we just don't feel like doing. But discipline, self-discipline, is we do it because we know we should. And we do it because it's right. We do the right thing simply because it's the right thing. It shouldn't have to be told to do it. We just do it. See, we, verse 2 tells us this. Don't copy the, the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think when you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It was said, by constant self-discipline and self-control, you can develop greatness of character. This initial, initial key to self-discipline is changing the way that we think. Wow, changing the way that we think. That's almost a miracle. <laughs> About changing the way that we process things in our mind and the, the, the outlook and the desires that we have go from being selfish to being Christ-like. What would Christ do in this situation? Not what would Kevin do, not what would you do, but what would Christ do in this situation? And begin to get my whole pattern of thinking, how would Jesus handle this? Changing the way we think. See, so our, our actions will reflect the way that we think, transforming us into that person. Whatever we think we are, we begin to act like that. However our pattern of thinking goes, so does our character, so does our actions, so does our life. Greek philosopher, philosopher Plato said, the first and best victory is to conquer self. That's the truth down to this very core of our being. We are our own worst enemy. Some of you may disagree with that and say, oh no, Satan's our worst enemy. Uh, Satan only feeds off of what we give him. He can only plot and plan against you by what you feed to him, by what you put out there, the things that you struggle with, the, the areas of weakness that you have. Whatever you say, whatever desires are there, you express them to somebody in some place. You even may express them in your prayer, and Satan hears them, and that's what he plots against you. So you see, it's not that Satan's your worst enemy. You can be your worst enemy. James tells us in one chapter 1 verse 14 and 15 each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed then when desires conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death we can truly be our worst own, own worst enemy christian character relies heavily on faith and grace and attitude and lifestyle of self control and discipline we must be able to submit ourselves to God for the Holy Spirit to continuously fill our lives up. And when he continuously fills our life up, it's amazing how we find it easier to walk the Christian walk. How do we gain self-discipline? It always begins in the mind. It always begins in the mind. Self-discipline. Overcoming our desire not to do what we know we should do. 
I know I should exercise, but it's a fight every time to do it. I know I shouldn't go back for that third plate of rice and gravy or when it's cool and the gumbo tastes real good, but we want to go back. I know there's a one-limit link on Buddha. You see, self-discipline, even in the small things, it always begins in the mind. We must allow God to transform the way that we think. The battle we fight is a spiritual battle, and it must be won from within. We cannot always control or alter, alter our environment or remove ourselves from others, and we can't remove other people from our lives always. So if we have to live in this sin-cursed world, we have to go to work at the same place, we have to deal and encounter the same people day after day after day, and we know that those people aren't really uh, affecting us in a very good way, and we don't react to them very well, if we know we can't change that, then who must change? We must change. We must discipline ourselves. The war is actually in here and in here. The war is not with that person at work. The war is not even with that person sitting across the table from you at your family dinner this week or next week through the holidays. That's not your war. Your war is really right here and right here. You can sit down with some people that you don't like very much and love them like Christ if you have your thinking right, if you have your discipline right. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a power of love and of discipline. Proverbs 28, verse 25, verse 28 says, He who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Listen, if we do not really embrace self-discipline, we do not embrace this self-control that is a fruit of the Spirit, if we do not allow the Holy Spirit to really grow in us and work in us, we're like a city with broken down walls. We have no defenses. In other words, we're going out into the world and it's nothing for demonic attack to come into our lives. It's nothing for them to wage war against us and we're basically helpless because we have no discipline. And we won't allow God to bring it into our lives. It was said to be disciplined is to put into practice the only kind of control God puts into our hands and that's self-control. You can't control others. You can't control your environment, but you control what you do and how you act and react. That's the control that God gives you. The rest, trust him with. The third component of Christian character is this, to have a system of core values. If I ask you today, what values are you living by? What core values are, 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 are ingrained to you that you make all your decisions based on? Everybody has them. Do you know what yours are? We all have those probably six or seven things in our life that we do not go against. And, and, and it's there, and, and we abide by it, and all of the decisions in our life are based on, on those values in our life, those core values. See, core values are principles which define what we truly believe and live by each day. Now, we may say that we love God first, but we don't act that way. You see, there's sometimes what we say and what we do don't match up. We may say we love God first, and we may say that we love others as we love ourselves because that's what the Bible teaches. It sounds real good, so we embrace that, but we don't live that way. And if we don't live that way, then that's not truly our core value. It may, it may be more like this. Kevin first, God next. It, it may be like that in your life. It may be Greg first, God next. You see, the core value is you being ahead of God, which is messed up. God always says, I'm number one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And Deuteronomy says strength. You see, Romans chapter 2, verse two, 12, verse, verse, Romans chapter 12 
verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. See, for Christians not to conform to this world, we must live by a higher standard of values. We learn those principles of Christ like Christ-like living as we grow in knowledge of God's Word. And we lean on those principles as we put them into practice by faith in pursuing God's will. We learn from God's Word. This is where the principles are that we need to learn and grow by. These are the core values that we need to incorporate into our lives. And we base all our decisions off of. Because when we learn these from God's Word, then we can lean on them to pursue God's will. If we do not have the core values of God's word in our life, then how we know what God's will is for our life? We won't learn his principles. If we won't learn his principles, then how we know his power living inside of us? We have to live in the world, but not be of the world. Society expects more out of us because we're supposed to live a high, by a higher standard, those strong core values. Why do so many people look at Christians and say, listen, if that's all it takes to get to heaven, then I'm just as good as they are. Why aren't they saying, wow, there's something different about you? It's because Christians have never embraced godly core values in their life. And they're just living by whatever they feel. If they feel like cursing someone out, I'm going to curse them out. If I feel like telling a dirty joke, I'll feel like doing it. There's no value system. If I feel like going to church, I'll go to church. It may be me first this Sunday, God, and you next. You see, when you have that core value in your life and you live by those core values according to God's word, it's amazing how you pursue what God wants in your life and what other people see in you. It's like, wow, there's something different. I see it. Something different. How we deal with circumstances in life will reveal our core values and thus expose our character. Core values guide our choices. They guard our heart and gauge, gauge our decisions. Core values are the nutrients which nourish the fruit of our character. Who we are inside. Set on God's principles, those values. The fruit of our character earns trust from others, communicates credibility and consistency, and it colors our perspective of life, people, and relationships. See, core values give our character structure to encounter a rigid, harsh world. Those core values help us stay the course and navigate where God is leading us, and we pursue Him when we have our core values based on God's Word, living out those principles. We say God is number one, then live like God is number one. If we say we love our neighbor as ourselves, then live as we love our neighbor as ourselves. Donald, Donald, I'm sorry, David McLean said this. He says, character is the pedestal that determines how much weight a person can sustain. If your character is the size of a toothpick, you can sustain a postage stamp. If your character is as thick as a column, you can sustain a roof. How is your character? How thick is your character? Based on God's principles? Based on your identity in Christ? But based on, on who you are? See, the depth of your character's character is evident by the strength of your value system. If you have a weak core value system, then your character will be frail. Listen, if, if you have, say, listen, these are the things I believe, but you don't practice those things you believe. If you say, this is what God's word said, but you don't adhere to those things, then your character is not very strong. When your values are based on God's infallible word and strengthened by the Holy Spirit, your character will be strong. Always empowered by God's word. Ask yourself, am I true to myself and what I believe? Is my values and beliefs founded on God's word? Do I help others and walk through interruptions and inconveniences in life to benefit others? Do I make the most of the time that I have? Do I grow in faith and knowledge in God's word? 
Do I pray for the Holy Spirit to guide me and discern truth? Do I respect others and look out for their well-being? Just some questions. Here's some examples of some Christian core values. Love God above all else. Operate by the golden rule, loving others and loving yourself. Grow in knowledge of God's words and trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. Some, so many times people say, I, I, I read this and I read through the Bible, but there are so many things I don't understand. Pray for the Holy Spirit to give you discernment and guidance. The Holy Spirit will not lie to you about God's word. If you're trying to understand it in your own intellect, listen, we're not smart enough for that, and I'll put my name in there too. We have to have discernment from the Holy Spirit. Nurture respect and be honest in all your relationships. Foster a pay-it-forward mindset. In other words, do good in others' lives, even though you have not been prompted to. Love what you do and strive for excellence. Listen, everything you do in your life is stamped by, done by a child of God. Whether it's Craig re restructuring a car that looks like nothing, <laughs> and he puts it together and it looks like a car. Whether it's Paul re restructuring, you know, when a hurricane comes through and his crews go out and, and restructure all the utility poles. And Greg serving over to nursing home. Jared's serving offshore. Wherever we serve, wherever, you stamp it done by a child of God. Kind of brings a whole new work ethic, doesn't it? Pursue learning and growth opportunities. Be creative, innovative, and positive for change. Support one another's personal development. Lift others up with encouragement. Wise words and thought, wise word and words and thoughtful actions. And have a grateful heart as we even see Thanksgiving approaching. Roy Bennett said it this way. He says, there are some values that you should never compromise. Never compromise on to stay true to yourself. You should be brave to stand up for what you truly believe even if you stand alone. Listen, we want to be living sacrifices for Christ. There's some things that we have to do. There's some, there's some lifestyle changes. There's some things that we need to get under the control of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. The last thing is this component of Christian character is integrity. Integrity. Integrity is the sum total of values and responses which compose the depth of our character. Are we really who we say we are? If I say I'm a child of God, do I act like it? In public and in private. If I say I read my Bible, do I really read my Bible? If I say I belong to a church, and that's my church family, do I actually attend the church? That kind of helps, you know, if you're a member of a church that you actually attend the church. We see in the latter part of verse 3, it says, Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given. Measure ourselves by the faith that God has given. See, integrity and humility go hand in hand. Christian character cannot exist without the humility of a person's heart and the integrity of the person's thoughts and actions. Integrity is that process of living out your core values, your thoughts, your, uh, your feelings and actions, and all those things where God is glorified in them. When these are con constant, consistent, then you are focused and your character becomes more Christ-like. We become those living sacrifices for Christ that Paul is encouraging us to do is when we live Christ first in our lives and we found all of our life on his principles and we begin to live by those principles. It's amazing how we pursue after his will when we have his word inside of us. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, What you do thunders so loudly in my ears I cannot hear what you say. Do your words and actions match? People who want to blame their circumstances for their poor choices are actually choosing to forfeit their integrity. There are so many things that are out of our control, but our character is not one of them. You can't blame your character on your circumstances any more than you can blame a mirror on the way that you look. He looked in the mirror this morning. I was like, wow. 
The Lord has a lot of grace. <laughs> that mirror didn't lie to me. It only gave back to me what I put in it. Your character will only give out what you put in it. What you put in it. Character is a choice. If you want a strong character, you must change your pattern of living with integrity, develop that life. Molaire said it this way, men are alike in their promises. It is only in their deeds that they differ. We all can make a lot of promises, but do we fulfill them? Do we live out what we say? It is a choice to be a person of empty words or a person of fulfilled deeds. It's a choice. Margaret Jensen said it this way, said, our character tomorrow will be the result of our choices today. To change your character, change your choices. Day by day, what you think, what you choose, and what you do is who you become. Listen, we want a godly life. We want to live a life that's a sacri living sacrifice to Christ. Then it's based on our character, the very core of our being, who we are. Well, how's that character structured? Where it's structured on the foundation of Christ. It's structured on God's word. It's structured on those core values, those principles that we learn. That's how we live out this Christian life that we begin to see that we are a living sacrifice for Christ. We have laid down our life and enveloped the life of Christ to follow after him. Character is a virtue which can be improved or marred by our daily choices. When we examine the components of our Christian character to be lived out sacrificially, we learn to strengthen who we are with a resolve empowered by the Holy Spirit. The only way that we're going to live this life as a sacrifice to Christ is that the Holy Spirit is in control, is that we're daily filled with the Spirit. We're filled with the Spirit. We're baptized with the Spirit the day that we're born again, the day we're saved. But listen, so often we're fighting against God for control. We're pushing the Holy Spirit aside because we want to sit on the throne of our life. We want control. We want to call the shots. And that's that battle that Christ is trying to teach us. Listen, you want me to be King of kings and Lord of lords of your life? Then you have to get off the throne. You can't sit there. It's mine. I bought you with a price. You are mine. I control and run your life. You notice he'll run your life, not ruin your life. He'll run your life, but he won't ruin your life. He'll stretch you more than you ever thought you could be stretched. He'll put you in places that you never thought you would be. All for his glory. And listen, the rewards that come into your life, you cannot begin to even comprehend when you allow God to be in control. When you're in control, you stay in your comfort zone. You don't want to do anything else. This is my little space. I'm happy here. And God said, listen, there's a big world out there. I need you. I saved you. There's work to be done. I'm leading you from where you are, and I'll grow you to where I want you to be. But I need you to trust me. I need you to follow me. I give you my Holy Spirit. I empower you. Now, all things are possible. All things are possible. What's your character like? Are you living as a sacrifice to Christ? Are you living as a sacrifice to Christ? Are you walking this life to bring him honor, to glorify him? Or you find yourself, Christian, just hanging on? Just bear day. Just waiting on Jesus to come. God has a lot in store for you. God has a lot of task in store for you, Christian. Will you follow him as a living sacrifice? By getting in his word to secure up your character. Identifying yourself in him all the way. Maybe today you cannot identify yourself in Christ because you've never made Jesus your savior. You've never put him in charge. Would you do that today? Would you just say, Lord, I've been doing it my way and I'm lost. I need to be saved. Lord, I give you all my sins, all my mistakes. 
Would you come live in my life? I give myself to you today. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you. God, thank you that your word teaches us how to be a living sacrifice. And Father, we also know that there are many who have never, never asked you to be Savior. Oh, Father, I pray today that those in the sound of my voice will look to you for mercy. And Lord, you give them grace more abundant than their sin. And you wash their sins away. Father, I pray today that you help us as Christians to be that sacrifice. God, it's hard in this sin-cursed world to be the person that you call us to be. Father, we can only do it by the power of your Holy Spirit living inside us. Fill us fresh and anew today, God, so that we can live for you in victory. In Christ's name, amen.